Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I'm your host, Rahul. I head the marketing here at Banishel. And today, Roxana and Todd are going to give us an amazing session on transforming developer experience using Kubernetes, Terraform, and Helm charts. If you have any questions, please put it uh, in the Zoom Q&A. You can even put it in the chat, but I, uh, it's preferred that you put it in the Q&A section. And we will take the questions at the end of the webinar, uh, but feel free to start adding the questions as soon as you have it. So with that, I will hand it over to Roxana and Todd for their introductions. Roxana. Hello, thank you for joining. I'm Roxana, I'm Vanishal's co-founder and CTO. I have a sysadmin, DevOps and dev background. And with in the four in the last four years, I've worked in many teams to and um, my main focus now is concerned to teams productivity and how they work together. If you have questions at the end of the webinar, please do put them or else Raul said he's going to put some really hard questions for us. Todd. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Todd Densmore. I'm the Director of Solutions Engineering here at Bunny Shell. Um, I have a few years of experience uh, doing dev work, uh, AWS cloud work, CI CD transformation, shift left, and most recently Kubernetes. So I'm very happy to be here. Looking forward to some, uh, some hard questions, just like Roxana. <laughs> Perfect. Let's uh, let's kick this off. Um, let's uh, there we go. Let's uh, let's start this off with a small discussion definition about the developer experience. What is it? Um, I think most of you are probably familiar with uh, user experience (UX), which that encompasses kind of all aspects of an end user's interaction with, with software. So the consumer of software, um, the software company, its services and its products. Very similarly, developer experience or DX uh, extends to all aspects of team-based software creation. So companies that develop software are increasingly more concerned with how happy and comfortable their developers are creating that software, delivering it to, to end users, and also um, you know, how other developers interact with that software, you know, from documentation, uh, even help, you know, getting help, Slack channels, things like that. Um, this all contributes to something called developer experience or DX. Um, and this is really an offshoot of years and years of an agile or DevOps philosophy in which you know, developers are encouraged to be proactive uh, in the tools that they select, in the ability to correct, uh, find, and fix bugs, um, and even with the process that they that they can choose internally, um, we can see a lot of this even in in a modern microservice strategy where microservices can be written in any language. Software development teams prefer to be able to choose their own tools and have the freedom to, to innovate uh, without fear of failure or finger pointing, things like that. The litmus test really for the developer experience can be summed up in, in how easy it is to get your friends to work at your, your software company. You know, is it something that you promote and enable internally and, and would extend to your friends and feel like they wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be mad at you if, if they joined. Um, you know, a lot of this too is, is kind of focused on, on the next generation of, of modern tools and modern practices, but ultimately it's really gauged by the developers that work there. So how happy they are. Um, it's kind of like net promoter score for developers. You know. any, uh, any comments there, Roxana? No, I really enjoyed what you said about, you know, uh, making your friends join the company and see if they have, uh, if they're pleased with it. I never saw it that way. So yeah, uh, some, some companies that I've worked with have, have offered um, internal hiring incentives. So, you know, 
while they still probably use external recruiters, they offer huge uh, incentives internally for getting, you know, referrals from developers. Yeah. It's, 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 it's really probably the, the test of, of how well oiled the internal developer machine is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So now that we have that definition out of the way, let's, uh, let's move to the next one. Perfect, and I'll take this one. Now that we, we said what uh, developer experience is, as and this webinar is created by Vanishal, which is an environment as a service platform, we also need to define what is environment as a service. And for that, we need to define what is an environment. So an environment is comprised of the application that needs to be deployed together with the infrastructure and services. Both of them undergo version control, which means that you have a YAML or JSON file that stands in your Git repository and you can, you can version different states of your environment. The benefit here is that first is it uh, increases release frequency and you'll see why in the following slides because if developers don't have to deal with managing environments and they can have it on demand, QA uh, teams can have it on demand and product or any stakeholder in, in uh, release can have uh, can see any feature that is being created on demand, then your release frequency is also going to, to be better. Now, and also the productivity. The, the reason why it raises productivity is because developers don't have to um, to take fr from their time to make sure that in their environment is up to date, that it is production-like, that the, their database is up to date. A funny thing that I always say is that when we estimate tickets in sprints, we estimate the amount of time that we need or the difficulty of writing that certain task. We don't estimate the amount of time that we have to spend to make sure that our workspace is prepared for us to, uh, to write code. So that's one of the things that gives developers frustration and in consequences, it, it, it lowers productivity. And the third, uh, third uh, benefit of course, is reducing cost because Always when you pay on demand for something and you use it, it, it goes up and it stays up and it consumes resources only for the amount of time that you use it, it's gonna, it's gonna save some cost. So it's exactly like the on-demand pricing on cloud provider, but now it's an on-demand pricing for the environment that your dev development uses, your QA uses, your automation uh, pipelines uses. So that's an environment as a service. And that's the, those are the three main pain points that it solves. So throughout this demo, uh, throughout this webinar, we're going to show you three flows and we're going to present you three challenges uh, that developers um, uh, have to confront each and every day they work. And um, after each, uh, each challenge, we're going to show you some, some flows and the Banishal platform that would really help those engineering teams overcome those issues. Right. Good. Yeah. So the first of these uh, developer challenges is, is managing environments. Um, you know, often new developers go through a long and arduous hiring process, they series of interviews, and when they actually start the first day, the onboarding is probably the first telltale sign of whether they've made the right decision or not. Um, we've all seen trying the, the the pain in trying to get the laptop set up with all the right libraries, all the right tools, and contributing to that first code commit. The time spent onboarding is really a great measure of how well the, the software internal development process is going at that company. And it, it's it's obvious that uh, usually it's, it's long and painful. Um, yeah. You know, and another... it's difficult because it, because it comes at a bad time. It comes when you've just joined a new team or joined a new project or 
Richard team and you want to show value, you want to show uh, that you, you, you can add a lot of value for that project and you're, you have a lot of difficulty, uh, you, you can't start doing your work because you don't have that dependency, you don't have, have access there, where's the cloud account, what are we using, where's the CI, how uh, is the process, so it comes at, at the worst moment ever. Absolutely. And you're probably nervous about your new, you know, what your new coworkers are thinking of you. And you've probably joined because one of your friends has referred you. And you want to make sure that yeah. uh, they're not going to look bad, you know, if, if you can't get up to speed very quickly. And you yeah. silently blame the tools. You don't want to say anything out loud. You don't want to criticize your new company, but you feel it. It's it's one of those things that uh, it's, it's really on your mind. Developer experience. Yeah, absolutely. And after you get your laptop set up, you know, hopefully you're on the right version, um, right version of, of the IDE that everyone else is using, or even the, the database that you spun up with a container. Hopefully it's it's latest, but uh, your latest might be different uh, than, you know, the veteran team lead that, that spun his up, you know, or hers up, you know, months ago. Who knows? Um, environment drift is is hard as well, especially when everyone is, is working in isolation. Um, and that's that's just another source of conflict and, and frustration as well. It's especially if, if this is your first week or two or, or third week and, and you're really trying to be productive, you think you you have your environment set up and you know enough to, to start contributing in a meaningful way, but then you find out uh, something's a little off, uh, works on my machine, but you can't figure out why it doesn't work. In, you know, for the, I don't know, staging environment or for the testing teams mm -hmm. tests. And this pain is much more acute for uh, QA engineers, for front end engineers, from mobile engineers. I mean, back end engineers may have uh, some ideas of how, how they can fix some infrastructure drift or some conflict, or they have a better way or, or are more knowledgeable <clears throat> where to look to see the issues, why they have uh, uh, those issues. But as for QA and front end, they don't know how to solve their issues. And if their development is locally, and if you're, we're working remotely, which means we do have to call somebody, we do have to make a screen share. It's just wasted time. It, it, it's wasted time for both you, both your colleagues, and it's half an hour that could be could have been much more productive. Sure, sure. And th there's other teams too that, that we often neglect, like the documentation team or the product team, sales demos. They're yeah. often, often yeah. uh, you know, Very involved. Right. So now is the time in which I show some uh, a flow in Banishal that's gonna uh, showcase some solutions to uh, to uh, taking uh, environment management from developers and uh, give, giving their time back. Okay, so I'm gonna sh stop your share screening. Okay, and hopefully you can see my screen now. So managing environments, let's go through an environment. Like I said before, an environment contains the applications and the applications of course can be from multiple repositories or from a monorepo. Very rarely you can have even different Git providers. That's something a bit rare. It goes in, into a migration phase more. But you, of course you can have a microservice application that is uh, across multiple repositories and their infra is alongside their, their small components or uh, a monorepo. And of course, an environment for developers is useful if you can change uh, different components to look at different versions. Okay, the second thing that is part of an environment is the infrastructure that can be deployed with different infrastructure as code configuration management tools. Um, one of them is Terraform, and it's not only uh, uh, infrastructure, but also services that you might be using uh, part of the uh, part of your infrastructure. 
Now, another thing that is part of an environment, it's not that much straightforward until it starts to hurt, is the data itself. And Bunishal also helps the processes involve data such as seeding, such as applying migrations, because Todd did talk about how hurtful drift is. Drift also refers not only to infrastructure, but also first to application version and then to data. So imagine a typical scenario where developers work on new features, they modify the schema of the database, and they push a change, right? It gets tested, it gets accepted, accepted in production. But what about the other stage environments? They're not getting updated. If you get, do a get pull and you get the new version, uh, that, that does not mean you're also updating the data. So Bunny Shell do, does help with these processes to keep all environments up to date. Now, the way that Bunny Shell can be used to manage the environments easily is first, by having a definition file in which everything that is uh, that refers to an environment can be uh, can be versioned in a git um, in the git repository all the applications the version that you're using also the the helm chart because Punishal also supports helm chart and we have a great documentation of how you can also add that and your terraform modules so imagine this if you have multiple if you have an infrastructure with a hundred microservices so that's a medium case right not all your environments will look the same you might want partial environments environments that contain some of the services environments that need to be production like and contain all 100 services and all the infrastructure while having this this possibility of creating yaml files you can even manage multiple times of environments with different components which will give developers possibility to create environments on demand and how how they can do that is first they can use the ui of course and you can clone any environment as easy as pushing a button and give it in a name they have cloned no, I, I'm going to name it Todd's environment because I have my environment and we, we still stick to the naming because I'm sure that that some of you did see development environments with with someone's name in it. So we're going to also create an environment for Todd. And what's happening at this step is that uh, I'm creating a new environment with all the application and all the infrastructure for Roxana's. And this is everything that Todd we imagine that he he's not a new colleague. He's joined One Shell for some time now. But if he wants an environment, he has it here prepared. He just has to deploy it. And that's it. And if Todd, because Todd is really, really technical, if Todd doesn't want to use the UI, that's great. He can use the CLI to do that. Let me show you how. So let's see uh, the API or the CLI. I have a, the API here. And of course, Body Shell has a full API for everything. So developers will be very comfortable working uh, with uh, all the tools that they love. So I've showed you the environment file. I've showed you the clone file, uh, the, the, the clone functionality. Now, one thing that I really want to insist upon is the idea of drift. And drift happens whenever new versions are released into production or are accepted into a feature branch. So let me show you an example. I have a PR created, and I'll talk later about ephemeral environments. I have in my GitLab a PR that I created wanting to merge feature one into the main branch. While this, it's very easy to create an environment and test this, uh, this feature, CICDs can do that. What they can't do is manage the state of existing environments update them and not all of them because imagine this use case you you are a dev with a development environment you don't want a, a, a automatic processes updating your your development environment randomly only certain environments need to be updated and see an CI CD needs to take care of this so if I merge the, and say yes please do uh, push feature one into the main branch what's going to happen in bunny shell is that the ephemeral environment that was created to test this PR is removing itself and my pre-release, an environment that must always reflect the master version, the main version, is being updated, it's it's updating itself. So this is also a scenario for front-end developers and, and QA developers, uh, QA, QA teams. They have environments and they need them up to date, both applications, both uh, data, both infrastructure. This is a way in which Bunnishell ensures uh, that all developers work up to date 
can manage their environment easily in a couple of seconds or minutes and no way they need to create any Zooms or, or, uh, or uh, Google Meets to, to, to create a new environment or to start onboarding. So this is the first flow that I wanted to show you related to environment management. And now I'm gonna pass it back to Todd uh, so he can go next to the next challenge. Thank you, Roxana. And that, I, I, I wanna say that's, the, that's probably the quickest I've ever gotten an environment. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. So next up in developer challenges uh, is the long feedback loop. Um, and, and just a comment there, um, it, when you do, when you are able to spin up environments, I, I know a lot of companies have Terraform, but when you are able to spin up environments on demand, it's really, really important to figure out how to manage those and keep them synced and up to date, because uh, I'm going to talk about um, clown car staging, which is, is kind of funny, but it's, it's when I was a working slinging code as a developer, I was always wondering which had up to date environments that I could test against. Um, so that's environment drift is, is something as well. Um, so next up in developer challenges is the long feedback loop. Um, nothing kills developer experience DX like waiting, um, getting out of the zone having to wait on something, whether it's a new environment spinning up or someone to approve and test your code, uh, review your PR. That's that's one of the, the momentum killers in anything. Uh, even, you know, say video games or, you know, running marathons. You know, imagine you're in a track and field event uh, in the relay race and your team only has one pair of shoes. And every time you hand off the baton, you also have to uh, hand off your shoes. That I mean, it's kind of a, a, a contrived metaphor there, but uh, you know, it's momentum killers are are morale killers as well among the development teams. Um, couple that with the fact that everything takes longer than you expect. You know, mm -hmm. even if we did estimate the time uh, of creating new environments into our sprint cycles, um, mm -hmm. it's usually in order of magnitude larger. Um, developer challenges with static environments. Uh, this is where I, I introduced clown car staging. And I, I apologies to the customer that we talked to recently that introduced us to us, but uh, they had one, one testing environment, one staging environment that all the developers had to, to use. And you can imagine, just like all the clowns pack into a clown car, all the developers packed into one staging environment for testing. Yeah. And as you as you can, yeah, that's that's painful. Um, yeah, and it's it's not only that you have to wait, but imagine that if you have static environments for QA for testing, and that's something that we see very common. First, it's the queuing, yeah, the wait time. But the second is that whenever those tests run, they affect that environment. It's not just the application, because uh, yeah, you can reset that, but it's also about the data. And if you're not working just with dummy data, like one, uh, like 10 megabytes, you you read me, real data for testing. Uh, I mean, it, you need to reset that data each and every time. And that takes takes lots of time because you can't go through uh, uh, with a snapshot because it would mean that you're recreating. But no, you're not. It's a static environment. So it's not only a waste of time, but it's also a waste of time because you are uh, you, you let defects go into your production because you're not really testing uh, properly. You're not testing with, with real data. Or you're not testing with the uh, with a full production-like uh, environment. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're an AI company or someone else uh, doing deep analysis on that data, it's probably hundreds of gig gigabytes, if not terabytes, of data, um, and that needs to be quality data. Otherwise, your 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 results are going to be off. Yeah. Perfect. So, Todd, uh, are you? Uh... Should I take the uh, take the screen now? I, I want to see what you're going to show me next. Perfect. <laughs> you know what I'm going to show. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> Perfect. So, okay. 
So now I have the environment. So we said, Todd said, and I do agree with him that there are two things that that make uh, uh, make the, the, the feedback loop long. First is the way that you you develop, right? And the second is the testing. Now, where why is it the way that you develop? Because if you're developing a push to deploy, then it means that you're working locally. And every time that you deploy something and you push that change, uh, you have to wait for images to build to be built and to be deployed, and then you have to test it. So each change, it, each line of change takes some minutes. That's frustrating, which is why developers still work locally, even though, okay, with monoliths, it wasn't that hard to work locally. But with microservices, it is. It's very hard. You can have hundreds of them. And to spin all of them in the all of them on your laptop, you start hearing the fan of the laptop. It's not liking it. And it's not only that you have more multiple microservices, your application can be cloud native. And most new applications or refactored applications application are cloud native, which means they use cloud resources and they depend on cloud resources. So how do you, uh, how do you run uh, S3, Elastic Cache and RDS on your local machine? Well, you don't because you can't. What you can do is you run alternatives. You, you run alternatives which are not the same as the product, what you're using in production or your mocking services which causes the, it works on my computer. That's the reason why, why that statement exists. So what's the solution here? So one solution is to do remote development. So the environment management can remain in the cloud, can remain remotely, and each uh, developer can have its own environment. And now what I can do is not run all the stack on my local machine, but run only the services that I need to change. For example, front end in my case here, right? I'm starting, I'm using the bunny shell command to start the, the, the remote service, which means that now every time that I do a change here, it's going to be immediately visible in the remote service and a remote environment, which, is, which means that I develop locally but I don't have my resources locally. I can access RDS, I can access, access Elastic Cache, I can communicate with, uh, with, uh, with, with Lambda. So everything in the remote environment has access to, your, uh, your, to, the, to the component you're developing and your, the component that you're developing locally has access to the remote ones. And this has multiple values. First, it's quick, it's very quick. Developers don't have to install anything on their laptop. The onboarding is, as I said previously, it's very fast. And the second thing is you can start collaborating. You can develop multiple services, front end and back end developers can even collaborate on the same environment, modify, modifying the same services. And every change that they may ch change that they make is instantly visible by their colleagues. This, the, 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 another value is that really, really quick feedback. Whenever I want some feedback on, for example, my designer, is this button uh, how it's just supposed to look or can you give me any feedback on this? And that's a stupid example. But yeah. No, example. I don't like the yellow, Roxana. Can we get rid of the yellow? Sure, I have to see where it is. But I'm not a front-end developer, so uh, yeah, I, I might not be able to do that. Somewhere here, I have a class, a CSS class with, with the colors. Not going to do that now, Todd. <laughs> Anything else you would like for me to do? But I, I can I can say uh, that this is Todd's. Look at that. This is. Uh, that'll make me happy. Put my name in there. That's great. Perfect. So this is your application now. So okay. we're collaborating very successfully now, and we didn't need to have a mid link because if I give Todd the URL from my environment, he's able to see the changes that I've done locally. So this increases enormously the speed of how developers work. And then the next step, Todd mentioned. Uh, uh, Todd mentioned. Um, uh, testing, because yes, that, that happens whenever developer push their changes, they need for uh, QA or automatic QA teams to start testing. And it takes some time if you have uh, environment management uh, issues or the flows are not right, it takes a lot of time to mimic the same environment. Or in the case of shifting left, 
um, they, uh, they, they do automa uh, auto automatic tests. But let's take the case of, Q, uh, of a QA uh, development team. What I need to do now to, to uh, send uh, the, uh, the feature to, to be tested is add my changes, not like this, add, perfect, commit my changes, push my changes, so developers don't need to, uh, to learn any new tool. They can stay in their favorite IDE, just the Banishal CLI command, and they don't even need to enter Banishal. They can create a merge request here in GitLab. And as soon as Banishal uh, finishes creating uh, the ephemeral environment is going to post the, the, the links to it. Now, I said ephemeral environment. Well, what is that? That's a short-lived environment, and its purpose is to, to get very quick feedback. Whenever I want to show some changes or allow a medium for a QA to test, I'm not going to give him my development environment. I'm not crazy. I need to work. I have a new task. I'm, I want to make those points in my sprint. So the QA needs a method to create himself a new environment and start testing. Well, with PRs, they don't even have to do that. They will have an environment already existing with both application and infrastructure, and of course, the, the, the correct data that they can use. So this is the use case for ephemeral environments. Together with remote development, they, um, they, they make the feedback loop much more smaller. Back to you, Todd, for the next challenge. Thank you very much. I still don't like the yellow, but I'm going to gather some more user data and take this to product. I'm sorry. Present the next slide and I'm going to start <laughs> changing the color. I'm looking. Okay. okay. Let me check. Developer challenges. Uh, number three, um, shifting left. So uh, we, I think we've heard a lot about shift left over the last few years. It, you know, it has its roots in Japanese auto manufacturing, the Toyota way. Think of it this way, if you're assembling a car and the customer decides that they don't want a four-cylinder engine in the car, they want a six-cylinder engine, the best time to change that is when you're assembling the car, not after. Um, same with almost all aspects of development. So if you're going to catch bugs, if you're going to catch security issues, you want to do that as close to the developer as possible so it doesn't actually get out into the wild where extra time and effort is spent with production outages or um, announcements of a, of a you know zero day exploit that's that's available those are very dramatic examples but you know anytime you can catch things closer to a commit or a PR the better um, and more effective and the, the cheaper it will be so um, with that in mind, you can see that having a quick feedback loop, having these ephemeral environments where you can test a change before it actually gets merged into uh, the main branch is, is going to be better. So by being able to spin these up, you can see that we push that feedback loop, we close that feedback loop, push it closer to the developer, um, and just an aside, developers now are being tasked with more responsibility with all the fancy tools we have. So a lot of times developers are also responsible for security, um, thanks to companies that, that provide these integrations right in, in the IDE. They're also being tasked with automation tests and, and things like that. So with all this responsibility, we want to increase developer experience, happiness, comfort, eliminate fear of failure. So making that feedback loop smaller will let those developers get information more quickly and be more confident that they uh, have fixed the issue or closed that security vulnerability, um, things like that. Does, that. does that make sense to you, Roxanne, or did I just uh, totally confuse everyone? No, it does make perfect sense. So shift left is, of course, as you know, uh, delegating some. It's about, uh, it's also related to the DevOps culture. It means that we are responsible for what we do. Uh, you, uh, 
like some year, years ago, monitoring was just for sysadmin people. Now it's not the case. Now monitoring and observability uh, are both for developers because developers do care about how uh, the, the, the performance of the application. There's also their responsibility and uh, security. Security is their responsibility. It's not that they have to know everything of, related to security. That's impossible. It's impossible to be very good at multiple domains to be like the best. You will be specialized in something and generalistic in, some, in other domains, but you need to care about the way that, that you're writing code. And this also comes to writing bug-free code. So when uh, you generally you had, uh, before you had a development team and a QA team, developers would write with tests locally a bit and they would push the changes for QA to test. Now this is sh shifting left and there are businesses that are even removing the QA teams and dedicating the responsibility to the developers that together in the DevOps culture create pipelines, for example, for automation tests, because that's, that's the only reason, uh, that's the only way to test. And also one thing that has changed is that with the shift to microservices, testing is not intuitive anymore. With monoliths, it was, you had some case scenarios that you knew you had to test, you, you, you did some smoke tests, but with microservices, there are much more issues, much more things that can go wrong because, because the communication is so much harder, which means that you do rely on automated tests to do that. But doing it and doing it properly, not with mock services, with good data, with different data sets and with production-like environments is not as easy, which is why this is a challenge that developers have. So... Todd, I, I, I just added some things that you already said. Yeah, no, that, that's great. And, and that triggered some more thoughts here too. So uh, that was very, very helpful. Thank you. Perfect. Um, yeah. Do you want, you want me to show to show something else? <laughs> you know, I didn't yellow. change the yellow color. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> I want to see it, yeah. I will, I will, I will add in the QA section, I will change the yellow color. Okay, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Let me share my screen. Yep. Perfect. Every time I show my desktop, I'm a bit embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Perfect. So shifting left, shifting responsibility of writing bug-free code. Imagine you're a developer, you have no QA team. So everything that you write will go into production. How do you do it? Well, you do it first with um, with automation tests. And the second one with the power of creating environments that are production-like. And like the slide said, with such responsibility, developers need to have some power. They need to have the power of creating environments that are production-like and use cloud services that are like in the cloud. But this comes with a but, like all things in life. If you're giving developers full, uh, full uh, access to creating any resources on the cloud, you might end up with some surprises, as you well know. For example, if you say to a developer, you know, build an RDS instance on AWS, choose any size that you think is going to, you know, be appropriate for application. They're going to go with a lot of cores. They're going to go with a lot of memory. So they never have any issues, which means a bit of governance over that ability is good. And also Banishal can help with that. We, we also add, uh, we, we add a wrapper on your infrastructure as code pro, uh, provisioning so that it's also easier for them to work with. But if they're creating databases that they have just some types that they can choose from, or if they need separate data, because even testing can be done with different databases, it's easier for them to work. So this is one of the things that shifting left comes with power but must also come with some governance. And the second was about the automation tests. So how do you achieve that? Well, in order for automatic tests to be successfully uh, run, they, they need to run on production-like environments, not on mocked up services and not on static servers that are there to just to queue with more uh, testing, uh, testing uh, uh, requests, because as Todd says, that creates frustration, right? So what, Punishel can do is when they when it creates ephemeral this ephemeral environment, 
Bunny Shell will post them on your Git uh, on your Git provider and can be GitLab, Bitbucket, GitHub, private GitHub, private GitLab, whatever uh, Git, Git provider you're using. And after this, what you can do is use the that specific environment to start your testing. Uh, uh, your testing scenario and it can be regression test, integration test, it can be end-to-end -end testing. And the way that this would work is first, well, one example is that, of course, you can use the GitLab CI to do that. It's very easy as long as you know the, the GitLab is the provider. So, of course, it knows the PR ID. It, know, it knows what the PR uh, branches and tags were, who needs to be um, merge in what so it it can connect to bunny shell it can trigger the creation to a ephemeral environment if you don't want it automatically and can also trigger a set of tests also if you prefer having another tool to do it you can do it with jenkins so for example i i've had jenkins here that connected to my environment that i've just created connected to the urls to start some front-end testing and also ran some testing inside the environment in some components took the feedback from those components and as you saw here it added them as comments here so what you achieve here is that first it's immediate feedback whenever developers do a pull request they get immediate feedback from their automation testing pipeline, which becomes very doable because you have parallel environments that are short lived that are there just for the testing to happen. And at the end, if the if the feature request is for every reason accepted, uh, uh, closed or even accepted, then it uh, the PR the ephemeral environment is going to close itself because it has fulfilled its purpose. And the second thing that, uh, that I want to remind that I've discussed previously is governance. Again, you can create environments for every PR test them and you can sleep well at night because you know that every code line of code that you've written is tested. But with that, comes a bit of governance so that your cost on the clouds don't skyrocket because that can be also a use case if you don't have that that governance yeah. so how did i do todd sorry it's still yellow you did, you did great you did great it, this it's still, uh, it's still, it's still yellow great. but uh you know we'll forgive that for for now um but th this seems this is fantastic this seems like it's a necessity for for any any development team that's either refactoring um into microservices or more microservices and it needs to ensure those those are working properly or if if you have a mature more mature process like trunk based development this this is probably already something that that you've you've had to struggle with either internally um just to make sure that that you are confident in your merges yeah yeah and although this, I mean, we are applying best practices that, that come now with DevOps culture and shift in left. And it, it seems simple, you know, because of course, like Todd said, he never had an environment spin up as quick as I, I created this environment for him. But Bunny Shell behind, there's a lot of things. It, can't, it, it can even, when you connect your repository, convert all your Docker Compose to Kubernetes. You don't even have to, run, to, to write any Kubernetes manifest if you don't like it, it controls the ingress. It's also compliant from the GitOps perspective. So anything that you modify in the Git is synchronized in the interface. It gives the ability to developers to work with the tools they love. It's, just, it's not just because developers don't really like new tools and being being forced to, to learn other methods. Developers like IDs, they love Git, they love, and that, and yeah. that's all they love. <laughs> So, I, I provide. Think, yeah, yeah I, I think you're right too. You know, I think developers, especially with infrastructure as code, would not be opposed to writing Terraform or, or maintaining it. But this frees them from having to worry about things that are, are you know, kind of a little yeah. bit external yeah. to their yeah. their primary concern. For example, where do I hold the state files? Who manages the state file? Who manages the updates to each environment? Which environment needs to be updated? But what if I want to learn, uh, create an alternative version of the Terraform? What if I want an ephemeral environment when I modify my Terraform code? So there is a lot of use cases in which you can play around just to make sure that every change that you do for application, for infrastructure, and for data 
is tested before you push it to production. This itself is the biggest reason why uh, uh, you, you get to do more releases, you, you increase the release frequency, because you get to have better collaboration in your teams and, and write your code and get feedback from, your, from what you wrote more quickly, which causes you to, uh, to fix the bugs or issues more rapidly. Yep, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. So I think we're open for questions now. Yes. And we have our first question. So the first question is, uh, Roxana, you showed uh, how the ephemeral environments work, um, how they get um, spun up, deleted, everything. Uh, is Punishal capable of like rolling back the environment rollback? Mm -hmm. So, for example, the way that Banishal rolls back, because Banishal does GitOps, and it will also allow, uh, show what version is in the Git, whenever you do a, a rollback uh, in the merge request, for example, it's going to also roll back your version. But if you don't want to touch your Git, and you want to do, do it really fast, of course, each application in that environment has a version, it points to a tag or a branch. You modify the branch or you modify the tag and it's gonna uh, roll back to the previous version. Yeah, or one simple example is if you, uh, if you do create, you know, a pull request, uh, you know, the, be the best rollback mechanism is not, re not, not going to prod when it's not ready. If you ensure that when you do PRs, you create ephemerals and uh, you, you can have automatic rules that say if the tests succeed, merge to master or to main. If the tests don't succeed, then don't merge and, uh, and close the pull request. You can do that as well. So, so when these environments are, are able to be spun up so quickly, you're saying that you can roll back by rolling forward, by making new commits, by fixing it, by doing quicker iterations, um, mm -hmm. like the old database schema trick by yeah. just, yep, yeah. yeah. fantastic. Great, great. Uh, next question is, uh, what if we have a monolithic application? Mm-hmm. Does Punishal help in that? Like, because you talked about Terraform, you talked about Helm chart, yeah. Kubernetes, but then if my application is mm -hmm. uh, monolithic, how can Punishal help? So, if uh, there are two, two things, monolith and microservices, both of them can be containerized. Banishal's main purpose is for applications that are containerized because it runs them on Kubernetes. If you have a Kubernetes, if you have a monolith application, and every monolith application can be containerized, right? You can run it in a Docker container. It doesn't does container a container doesn't necessarily mean mo, uh, microservices. It can be the single code and having multiple functions. Of course, it can run with 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 Banishal. Also, from from the different clients that we have, not all of them have all their all their applications in Kubernetes. Of course, it's a mix. It's a mix on. So they they also have some instances, some VMs, EC2s, droplets, whatever cloud prefer to call them they have the application that run in kubernetes and some serverless and because banishal also is integrated with terraform if you have such components like application components that run on virtual machine you can deploy you can also deploy them alongside the cube but just to summarize banishal's main purpose is for containerized applications which suits both microservices and monoliths do you agree, Todd? I agree, and I, I think that if you, if you have a monolith and, you, and you're attempting to break it down, um, you know, you start small. You take one one area of the monolith that you can yeah. containerize and externalize into microservice. Mm -hmm. I think something like this is very important to make sure mm -hmm. that you're getting it right before you um, release to production. Yeah. And one great part that I want to uh, uh, want to say here is that if you're in your uh, uh, journey to 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 and you want to start uh, um, 
splitting the services and creating microservice and then reaching a, a deployment on Kubernetes, Punishal can make that much less painful than it is learning Kubernetes from the scratch, start writing manifests, go uh, fail for some tasks. You also have to learn some security. Kubernetes is flexible, it's powerful, but comes with uh, a very steep learning curve. So because Bunnyshell can uh, automatically convert Docker Compose to Kubernetes and Docker Compose is really, really easy to write. It's, it's very, very friendly. Uh, it can make this journey much less painful and even, uh, even a, a good journey for, for your development team. Yeah, yeah. Two quick observations there. I think that any company that that is is has monolith and is kind of breaking that apart has some sort of internal tooling that they probably don't want to maintain. That's not their core function, but they're, they're probably spinning up some sort of environment. Um, but the orchestration of those environments is is what's key as well. Moving data from environment to environment, and that's that's usually not a primary concern for for driving new features to market. Um, mm -hmm. And the other thing too that Roxana mentioned is, you know, the journey to Kubernetes uh, is sometimes frightening. And when you can have clusters spun up on demand with your application correctly running in them, um, that allows developer confidence uh, and developer experimentation as well. So they can learn a little bit about Kubernetes, but uh, make sure that they're still being efficient in their development. Great. And then we will take one last question here. Uh, you talked about like microservices and Bunny Shell does all the heavy lifting with Kubernetes and Terraform, et cetera. Does it mean it replaces DevOps team? If we already have it, what, what, how to think about that? For sure, it doesn't replace his DevOps team because, frankly, there is no really such thing as a DevOps team. DevOps is a culture. DevOps is not a team. Developers work with the DevOps culture, which means that they work together and they test what they write. They have uh, this culture at which the processes, their development processes is very uh, linked to a CICD that builds, continuously builds the images, conti does continuous integration and does continuous delivery. Now, those DevOps teams usually mean uh, those, uh, those guys that are more familiar with CICDs, with provisioning, with monitoring, with observability, with uh, high availability. And usually they're very concerned about production and less concerned uh, about the developers. So what Banishal does, in, it doesn't uh, replace DevOps teams or neither uh, uh, DevOps culture. It comes as, as a helper for developers to remove some of the bottlenecks in waiting, waiting for provisioning of environments, waiting for their code to be tested. But those DevOps teams that work with ensuring that um, uh, that CICDs and tests are running, th those guys, uh, we, we still need them. So, so you're saying that th this could possibly free them up to, to work on the other important things that are always on their list. Exactly. Uh, exactly. There's always work to be done, right? There's yeah. always things that in the backlog. I've never yeah. seen my backlog. Yeah. Be, and usually they're very concerned about production and less about development environments. And, and because we of the uh, developers are usually the one responsible with maintaining their their environment up to date but if they don't even have permission for some of the actions that are required to to, uh, to make their environment up to date maybe create some uh, resources on the cloud they have to send tickets to devops teams and devops teams don't respond as quickly as developers would need that's a blocker that's increasing the the, the loop yeah so let developers focus on development <laughs> and the SRE teams focus on production. Is that exactly, exactly. And Banishal comes as a link for both of them. It comes as an orchestrator of environment. And that's very useful both for developers, but also for SRE teams. Fantastic. Any Great. other questions? So we can give it a couple of minutes, but I think that's it for today. Okay. okay. So if there are no questions, now we start with the radius of the sun and so <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, exactly. So uh, thank you, Rukmana. Thank you, Todd. And thank you, everyone, for joining today. If you want to get started with Bunny Shell, it's super easy. Go to bunnyshell.com, get started free. 
If you want a personalized demo with specific use case you have, just go to contact us, fill that out, and someone will reach out to you. We have recorded this session, so you will receive an email with recording and some, uh, some nuggets from this session in the next couple of days. Uh, and with that, uh, we will conclude this session. Thank you again, everyone. Thanks, Roxana and Todd. Thank, Thank you. you, Roxana.